Welcome to Bluegrass Stockyards in the Bluegrass Regional Marketplace. We're glad to have you tour our museum. This video is provided as kind of a self-guided tour to allow you to enjoy your time here and, and learn a few things about the different uh, items we've got in our museum. Our intent is for this to be a ever-changing uh, display of history, memorabilia, and information for our visitors. We hope you enjoy your time. One of the focal points of the museum is the large aerial photograph of the west side of downtown Lexington. This photograph was taken in 1937. That would have been roughly 10 years before the founding of Bluegrass Stockyards. There's several things on the map that are recognizable uh, that still are active today. The Red Mile Race Course down on the lower part of, uh, of the photo as you move up and to the right, the Lexington Cemetery, uh, very noticeable feature. Uh, the rock quarry at the corner of uh, Forbes and Old Frankfort Pike, which is still there. Up toward the top of the picture, uh, the old Lorillard Warehouse. It's one of the largest warehouse complexes ever in Lexington that ran across uh, alongside the railroad tracks just north of Main Street, uh, off to the north of the viaduct as you cross over the tracks. Uh, interestingly, uh, New Circle Road would eventually be just to the north of the Lorillard warehouses and travel around the west side of town, uh, skirting along what through in this photograph is still very, very much farmland. Uh, New Circle would cut just to the east of Calumet Farms, which you can see the centerpiece of there, and continue on south and around town. Um, it's amazing to look at this photograph and realize how much of the west side of Lexington, uh, very much populated and very active today, was open farmland at that point in time. Central to this photograph, uh, and, and very, very close to the center of it, is what would eventually become uh, bluegrass stockyards. The Swift Buying Station, which existed, uh, or which was uh, built around the turn of, of the century, 1900, uh, was about a 15,000 square foot building. Uh, in 1946, it was purchased by a, a group of individuals that broke, broke off from the old Clay Watch stockyard on Angliana Avenue to form what now is Bluegrass Stockyards. Uh, just to the east of the stockyards is the McConnell home, which we'll talk about a little more later. There's some other features here in the museum about the McConnell home. Uh, at the time of the fire, it's interesting to note that Bluegrass Stockyards occupied uh, that entire block of land to the west of the Swift Buying Station. Uh, you can see the turn in what is now Lyle Road there and realize that the stockyard extended on beyond that uh, to the seven acre facility that existed prior to the fire. Uh, you can also notice as you zoom out and look more generally at the map, many of the streets that exist today on that side of town uh, simply weren't there at that point in time. Just to the left of the uh, downtown uh, photograph are two Burley tobacco photographs that I, at first blush might appear to be just uh, really neat photographs of old hand-tied tobacco and the old basket method of, of marketing uh, the hand-tied tobacco that existed up until the uh, probably mid to late 1980s and uh, many of us are old enough to remember hand-tying Burley tobacco. Uh, the, the most significant part about these two uh, pieces of photography is not so much their subject matter uh, but where they hung for many, many years. Uh, they adorned the office of world-renowned and revered uh, Burley tobacco specialist at the University of Kentucky, uh, Ira Massey. Uh, he was known around the world for his expertise uh, and his class as an educator, a resource, and a researcher. Just to the right of the uh, aerial photograph, are, are two framed uh, blueprints. The upper one is the floor plan and layout for the old Swift buying station. 
which eventually became the part of the stockyards known as the main alley and the 40 pins, along with the scale house uh, and, the, and the lower loading docks up on the east end of the barn. Uh, this set of plans was actually <clears throat> located after the fire, and it's interesting to see how uh, Swift had that station set up uh, uh, to handle mainly hogs at that point in time, uh, and how much of that uh, original layout and floor plan uh, uh, maintained and, and was still a part of, of the stockyards at the time of the fire. Uh, one of the most interesting pieces about this uh, particular floor plan and layout, at the bottom of it you can see where the railroad spike ran up along behind uh, uh, the 40 pins up what was uh, eventually to become the lower alley and Eugene Barber and Sons yardage pins. Uh, that railroad track ran up right up through the middle of what would have eventually uh, be that lower alley and animals could be loaded directly out of the back of those large pins onto rail cars. Just below that is a pin layout of uh, bluegrass stockyards uh, as it existed uh, roughly at the time of the fire. Uh, there would have been some improvements and some changes uh, uh, since this floor plan was drawn, but uh, you do have the stack alleys in place. Uh, it shows the area for the new sail ring. Uh, most notably, what would have changed on this drawing uh, is just to the west of the sail ring, uh, what was the sheep and hog yard had been remodeled at this point uh, and would not have been chopped up in this many small pens because we uh, would have housed cattle in those pens at this point. This drawing represents about the, the eastern two-thirds of the layout and floor plan of the old yards. In the opposite corner of the museum is a wall hanging that honors the Fister family and the Donner Rail area of Fayette County. Uh, the area was named and this farm was named Donner Rail uh, for one of the family's biggest claims to fame which is still holding the record for the longest shot to ever win the Kentucky Derby. Uh, Donna Rail went off at 91 to 1 and paid $184.90 on a $2 bet. Uh, this farm was in the Fister family from the late 1700s all the way up until uh, 2002 when it was purchased by uh, several of the owners of Bluegrass Stockyards. Uh, it was operated as a thoroughbred farm for many years. In later years, uh, a general agricultural operation with tobacco, cattle, uh, hogs, and uh, a large vegetable uh, operation to take care of the food needs of a very large uh, Catholic family that, that was uh, raised here. The ox yoke that uh, adorns the wall on the, on the west side of the museum uh, is an actual functional uh, ox yoke that was used. Uh, it hung for many, many years on the exterior of Eugene Barber and Sons offices. Uh, because of concern about its deterioration in the weather, it was actually moved inside the stockyards in uh, about 2014. Uh, as you can see, it was damaged in the fire, but was one of only a couple wooden items that survived the fire and we're proud to uh, have it in here as a reminder of our heritage and, and history. Just below the old ox yoke are a collection of pictures. Uh, back in the 1950s and into the 60s, uh, before many of our local fairgrounds were as developed as they are today, uh, many of the major 4-H and FFA livestock shows were actually held at the stockyards, the district steer shows, uh, a couple photographs here as champion animals uh, through the 1950s, uh, and a heifer shown by one of our owners, Scott Butcher, um, a Charlet heifer back in the uh, 1970s. The William McConnell House, uh, a source of pride uh, for the entire Bluegrass family, sits at the eastern end of our downtown property where the old stockyards was. Uh, at the beginning, when the stockyard was first formed in 1946 and continuing up until the mid-1970s, the McConnell House served as the office for the stockyards. 
Uh, after that point in time, it's been utilized as an office building by Eugene Barber and Sons uh, cattle order buying business up until the time of the fire. The McConnell House is very unique in Lexington. It's the oldest house in Lexington, still standing on its original foundation. It was built by William McConnell when he returned uh, from his trip west. He, he and his brother originally passed through Lexington, uh, found the McConnell Spring, which is uh, just to the south of, of the old stockyard site on the other side of Frankfort Pike. And uh, they set, stayed for a period of time, explored the area, uh, moved on, went to Missouri, uh, spent a couple years there, and then came back to Lexington to uh, establish their permanent settlement. Uh, th this house was built by William McConnell. There is another smaller dwelling uh, just to the east toward downtown, down the railroad tracks, uh, that was constructed by his brother. The McConnell house has been maintained very much in its original state for all these years. It was built in the late 1700s. It's all stone construction. Uh, much of the interior woodwork uh, and stonework is uh, still visible and still original. Uh, and again, is a great source of pride for, for our organization. Just to the left of the picture of the McConnell House uh, is a wall hanging of uh, a Business Monday edition of the Herald Leader that featured uh, Mr. Eugene Barber. Uh, Eugene would be the father of uh, Gene and Larry Barber, which are current owners of Bluegrass Stockyards. Uh, Mr. Barber was a pioneer in the uh, livestock business, not just the cattle business here in Kentucky, a native of Fleming County. He and his wife, Etna, had uh, built a very successful uh, livestock brokerage business, uh, handling cattle and hogs all over the eastern and southeastern United States. Uh, Larry and Gene grew up in the business and continued on with that. Uh, Mr. Barber, his wife Etna, and Kenneth Holt were the three individuals that uh, purchased Bluegrass Stockyards from its original uh, group that founded it and ran it from 1946 to 1976, at which point in time Eugene Barber, uh, Kenneth Holt, and Mrs. Barber uh, purchased the stockyards and continued its operation. At several points around through the museum, you'll see some antique hardware hanging. Uh, an example here in the corner by the doors. Uh, as we pan back around to the other side of the room, there's a couple more examples of the same uh, type of cattle hardware. These are actually cow yokes. And up until the 1960s and 70s, there were very, very few operations that had any sizable number of cattle at all. Uh, most farms were subsistence agriculture. Their main concern was feeding their family. If they had product to sell in the cash market, that was uh, a bonus. But their primary uh, goal was to feed their typically large families at that point in time. Uh, most of those families only had, uh, you know, two or three cows. Definitely a milk cow to supply uh, milk, cream, butter for the family, and maybe a beef cow or two to supply meat for the table. Uh, because of that, there wasn't much infrastructure. Those families typically didn't have a lot of fencing. Uh, they put yokes on their cows to keep the cows from uh, ranging too far away from home. Uh, even as uh, barbed wire started to come into the area, people got larger numbers of cattle. Uh, yokes were still used because uh, one or two strands of barbed wire, a significant investment for many families at that time, uh, if you'd made that investment, you sure didn't want the cows, uh, you know, tearing the fence down. So you, they continued to use yokes uh, for many, many years. In the glass case uh, just below the ox yoke, uh, you can view many assorted items of uh, promotional paraphernalia of many different agricultural uh, companies around the Lexington area. One of the most interesting things in this case is... Uh, uh, a couple sets of graded feeder calf pen sheets from the 1960s. Uh, these sheets show the different uh, groups of cattle that were offered to sale and their descriptions and the prices of those, which is pretty interesting to see the uh, 
uh, dramatic changes that we've experienced in uh, types and kinds of cattle, the weights they're marketed, and the prices that they bring. <clears throat> Moving around to the other side of the museum, uh, on the old luggage cart that sits out in the middle of the room is uh, a, a placard from a feeder calf sale that would have been uh, in the early to mid-1970s. You notice that this placard announces that uh, over 7,700 head of graded feeder cattle will be offered for sale in a series of sales around the state. Uh, Angus, Hereford, Shorthorn, and mixed cattle would, been, would have been offered. The graded feeder calf sales were a really, really big uh, event, a uh, series of events all around the state of Kentucky. And the Kentucky Feeder Calf Association is the predecessor to what we now know as the uh, very successful Kentucky Cattlemen's Association. Alongside that, a couple of just kind of neat items. Uh, one right here and another on the other side of the feeder calf sign. Uh, something we don't see in today's world very often, uh, but uh, very prevalent back in the days when families just had one or two cows, and especially one of them was the family milk cow. Uh, these are wieners. Wieners were put on calves. Uh, they hung over their nose and prevented the calf from nursing uh, unless the, the owner wanted the calf to nurse the cow. And uh, they, they were used not only to wean the calf, but to limit nursing to protect the milk supply for the family. Also on the old uh, cart, there are two machines, uh, foreign to most of us today, but very, very important uh, back in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, these are check cutters. Every check that was written by the yards and many of the order buying companies were hand punched into these machines and the checks were stamped uh, right there in the office. The glass case on the opposite side of the uh, museum from the ox yoke uh, contains uh, many publications. The top shelf contains uh, several books that uh, chronicle the history of the cattle business in Kentucky, in the eastern United States, and in the Ohio Valley. One of them in particular, off to the right, uh, is a very interesting book that, that is the history of the cattle kingdom in the Ohio Valley from 1763 up to 1860. Uh, a pretty hard read but a very interesting book and ironically uh, it contains the names of many of our customers still yet today whose ancestors were very significant in the importation of many of the first purebred uh, cattle to come to the United States from England uh, as well as many of the players that left the eastern United States and moved west uh, to found the cattle tribes. On the south wall of the museum, over in the left hand corner, starts the timeline of the history of the cattle marketing business. And we start that out with a handwritten bill of sale on 32 head of cattle dated March 15th, 1816. I uh, would encourage you to take a look at that, look at the prices, look at the descriptions of the animals, and, and just marvel about how far we've come in our livestock marketing business. Our story wall tells the history of the livestock and predominantly cattle marketing business in the United States. Uh, the first significant organized effort to market cattle in the United States would have been the cattle drives of the Old West. Uh, around the time of the Civil War when you had large concentrations of people, uh, the military, as well as growth in our cities, uh, cattle drives became necessary. Uh, one has to remember, transportation very limited at that point in history. Uh, railroads were just beginning to come online. And most significantly, there, we didn't have refrigeration at that point. So the, the meat had to be taken on hoof uh, to the areas where it was going to be consumed. These cattle, cattle drives originated in the southwest, in Texas, and even as far south as into Mexico, where large bands of native wild cattle and some domesticated cattle were moved north uh, to railheads in Kansas, but also driven further on north to the larger cities like Chicago, Minneapolis, St. Paul, 
and even as far as some of the larger cities in the eastern U.S. What do you do with those cattle when you get to the end of the drive? In uh, many of these large uh, growing cities that had huge demands for meat and were also hubs for supplying the military, uh, large terminal markets sprang up to handle hundreds of thousands of head of cattle at a time in large outdoor pens. Uh, pictured in this placard in our timeline, uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, the Union Stockyards in Chicago, as well as uh, an old, old photograph of the Kansas City yards. These terminal markets were typically surrounded by packing plants. Uh, buyers from those uh, packing companies would go into the yards and whether working through an agent, a commission company, or in some instances, uh, trading directly with the farmers and ranchers would buy uh, those animals directly out of the pen and walk them literally uh, to the packing plant where they'd be processed for local consumption in those large cities. As we moved along in history and began to see growth of more mid-sized cities, Louisville being a prime example, you started to see uh, smaller terminal markets pop up scattered around the country to service the protein needs of those growing populations. Uh, the Bourbon Stockyards in Louisville was a historic market that operated until the mid-1970s. It operated initially as a terminal market and then in its latter stages uh, evolved into an auction market. Many, many animals were walked to market at that point in time uh, as uh, transportation was still a considerable challenge. And as you were uh, bringing animals in out of the countryside into the city uh, for processing and consumption, uh, many times walking them was the only way to, to get those animals to market. From the late 1800s uh, into the early 1950s, rail transportation was extremely important in the livestock business. It was the only efficient means of moving animals long distances uh, safely, quickly, and efficiently. Uh, many of the markets, Lexington, Lancaster, uh, uh, around our area were equipped to load rail cars directly out of the stockyards themselves. Uh, many, many millions and millions of animals uh, moved in this fashion and, and it began to break down the need for the large terminal markets and the large terminal yards because we now had a mechanism to make the animals more mobile. At the bottom of this placard you begin to see that after World War II we started to have dramatic improvement in road infrastructure as well as improvements in the vehicles we had to drive on those roads. And as those changes took place you began to see auction markets growing, popping up in more and more towns, uh, at this point in history, uh, in the 1950s, uh, there were 75 plus auction markets in the state of Kentucky alone. Uh, many of the small rural towns around our state had their own uh, local auction market. Many of those animals were uh, purchased in those local markets and, and aggregated uh, into some of the bigger markets as the week went along and then eventually traded on to the west. Along about that same period of time is when you began to see uh, refrigeration uh, come into play. And because of that, you began to see the feedlot industry spring up in the Midwest and the upper corn belt. You saw packing plants move away from the large cities and closer to where the cattle were and out into the Midwest and the corn belt with us having the ability to move those animals uh, directly to them. Interestingly, in the lower right-hand corner on this particular placard, uh, you can still see the, the railroad spike and a couple railroad cars that are actually sitting uh, lined up behind the old stockyards there in downtown Lexington, waiting to load cattle out of the 40 pens. This would have been before the addition of the lower alley and uh, pens 1 through 20, uh, the barber yardage pens. Moving on down the timeline, the 1950s, 60s, and 70s were certainly the heyday of the auction market business. Uh, huge social event, as well as an important source of income and in turning a year's production into cash for many of the farmers in the local area. If you look back at market reports from this period of time, 
Uh, it was not at all uncommon to see a market report out of the Lexington market uh, with 10 to 15,000 head of animals on it for a week. Uh, interestingly, uh, oftentimes half to two thirds of those animals on that market report would be feeder pigs and lambs. Obviously those two lines of business, those two lines of livestock production have changed dramatically since that point in history. The sheep business has uh, uh, lost significant numbers and the feeder pig business has moved in the contract production uh, and we don't see significant numbers of those animals in the markets uh, in today's world. At the bottom of that placard, over to the right, uh, is a picture of uh, uh, old trucks lined up waiting to unload and, and also coming back the other direction away from having already unloaded at Bluegrass Stockyards. Uh, they're on Forbes Road in Lexington. In the right hand uh, side of that photograph is a white building uh, that was uh, a dance hall. Dance Land was a very popular location uh, there in downtown Lexington. Uh, many of the people that came to the stockyard with their year's production uh, made a big trip out of it and uh, stayed in Lexington, uh, bought their supplies while they were here, and uh, enjoyed themselves and uh, uh, relaxed a little bit there at uh, Dance Land. Moving further down our timeline, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Bluegrass Stockyards was purchased by the Barber and Holt families uh, in 1976. The last major expansion of the stockyards occurred right after that sale. It was extremely significant as it included the addition of the sale ring as it existed at the time of the fire. The arena seated roughly 200 people. Uh, the, the sales were rated for 50,000 pounds of cattle and was state of the art for that point in time. That was also a very significant uh, timeline when uh, the market moved from an in-weight market to an out-weight market, which basically means that the sale ring became the scales and the cattle were weighed right there at the time of sale in front of both buyer and seller. Uh, Kenneth Holt oversaw the construction and the grand opening of the new facilities, uh, and it was, a, it was a grand time in the history of Bluegrass Stockyards. We end our timeline with uh, a little bit of information about uh, the facility that you're visiting today, we're extremely proud as a company to have uh, ventured out, not only paying homage to our history, uh, the class, the importance of the old stockyards in downtown and the Bluegrass Livestock Marketing Group in general, but venturing out into other uh, areas, drawing the community into our business, partnering with other uh, service providers, and vendors of local products to provide a total experience where farmer, consumer, community members can come together, learn about our food system, where food comes from. Uh, we're very proud of the addition of the classroom here where we're educating young people about agriculture, about food, and about the cattle business. We hope you enjoy your time here with us at Bluegrass Stockyards and the Bluegrass Regional Marketplace.